Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the BCK's lunch webinar. And it's our first ever webinar together with our colleagues in Japan and Taiwan. So very exciting to have this as our first cross-regional uh, webinar with these uh, fellow chambers. And our topic today, as you might expect, is on COVID-19 and obviously looking at this from a regional perspective on the um, uh, situation that we find ourselves in the three different markets. So. In terms of the detail of the discussion, we'll have an update from, from each of us on what, is, what life is like at the moment in terms of the virus, then also some of the government directives and actions that have been uh, taken with regards to the outbreaks, also the impact uh, generally on our members and also the business environment. Um, there are some survey results that can be shared to that effect as well, and then also potential exit strategy and also business recovery in the region. So I think it's worth stating that um, we're not obviously medical experts. We're also not um, su super on the uh, in when it comes to our respective governments. But I think what we are what we are aware of is the sentiment and the feedback of our members. So I think it'll be very interesting for us to to share that with our respective members. And so on today's panel, we have. Uh, David Bickle, so David's the president there in Japan, and also Steve uh, Parker, who is the CEO of the British Chamber of Commerce in Taipei, and then myself. So I'll be acting as the moderator, uh, just in order to facilitate the discussion. But um, of course, we're all going to be equally taking part here. We just in terms of some logistics, we have a Q&A function there. So if any of you have any questions, please uh, just click on that and type your question. If you want to address it to a particular person, feel free to to write that into the question. If not, um, then you know, we, you know, I will address it to whoever it's most pertinent to address it to, or, or indeed, to to all of us. Uh, the webinar will be an hour in length, and we should go to questions with about fifteen minutes to go. It may may end a little bit earlier, a little bit longer, but uh, we'll try our best to keep it to that hour. So, without further ado, I'd like to go to our first uh, speaker. So, can I pass it over to you, David? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sean. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to participate today and uh, for you and your team there for organizing this today. Um, I think to provide some context about uh, Japan's approach to dealing with COVID in terms of the restrictions placed on society and the way in which companies are working, uh, it's helpful to see where Japan sits relative to other countries at the moment in terms of these restrictions. Um, Oxford University and their Department of Government have come up with quite a helpful stringency index. Um, this looks at a number of standardized measures of uh, lockdown type measures um, that, it, that uh, pose restrictions on people's lives. And they've looked at this across uh, several, well, all of the countries. Uh, and they come up with a, uh, a standardized score, an index from one to 100. So at the, the more restrictive life is uh, it's at the top end of the range at 100 and the less restrictive the lower the the score is so it's not really saying that a high number is better it just means more restrictive so to give some perspective at the top end of the range you see countries like france which are at 100 also a number of the european countries uh, spain italy denmark around 95 uh, korea and the us 76 the uk at 71 so you can see a, a trend towards less restriction. Japan comes behind the UK uh, at, at 67. Um, and perhaps to give a bit of a perspective, that's slightly higher than Sweden, which is in the news a lot, which is at 62. So I think some of the reason for this variation in stringency is due to do with the different policy tools that the countries have available to them, but it also reflects the way uh, the approach to managing the economy. Um, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, winning economist Paul Krugman tweeted recently that this is unprecedented in a number of the countries around the world, for example, the, uh, the European countries and America are effectively, the governments are effectively putting their economies into a coma and then using massive government stimulus really as life support to try and ensure that there are still some businesses and a viable workforce left when it comes time to bring the economy uh, back out of that again, out of that coma state. 
Um, Japan basically doesn't have the, the legal tools to go into a full lockdown like we've seen in some of these other countries. And their approach is slightly different. Rather than going for coma, they're, if you like to make an analogy, keeping the patient alive, uh, monitoring, uh, changing the economic uh, you know, stimulus and, and trying to treat the patient, I think, in a more, in a more active way rather than this coma state. So if we look at the timeline uh, that you can see on screen, the, uh, for Japan, like many countries, it's been a gradual story of ratcheting up uh, the response measures to the COVID challenge. Probably something to note is that Japan was exposed fairly on, fairly early on um, in the timeline, way back in January, uh, and that's when their um, response you know, began, say, before many countries. Um, obviously, in February, Japan was thrust into the international spotlight with the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which was quarantined in Yokohama and was gaining a lot of international news coverage. Um, you'll see at the bottom of the slide, we've included some statistics for the number of uh, the cumulative number of uh, confirmed cases uh, and also deaths. I think it's worth uh, sounding, and it's probably you know applies to everybody, sounding out of caution, particularly in relation to the number of cases. Um, and this is something that uh, Lawrence Summers, the former US Treasury Secretary pointed out recently that statistics on cases are, are pretty much, you know, well, very difficult to interpret because rather than the progress of the disease, they probably reflect the amount of testing that governments are actually doing. Uh, and Japan is one country where you may have seen from the news that is not doing a lot of testing. I think you know, one of the reasons for that was at an early stage, uh, they did not want to overwhelm the hospitals uh, and were focusing more on a, uh, a test, trace, uh, well, limited testing, then very aggressive tracing and isolation, which in the early stages of the disease uh, appeared to be um, you know, working uh, you know, with some effect. So uh, you know, a point to take from this uh, timeline is Japan has been dealing for several weeks uh, you know, since the virus was first noted in the country, um, you know, and without seeing the you know, devastating spiraling up of cases that we've seen on the news in places like Europe and the US. Um, in terms of key milestone, in February, um, the government announced with, without really much prior notice, um, a closure of all schools in Japan, which was quite dramatic. And I think that prompted many uh, businesses that had the capability for their people to work from home to really strongly encourage as many of their people as possible to, to begin home working. Uh, then around the end of March, we start to see an uptick uh, in the number of confirmed cases and also sadly, the number of deaths from COVID. Uh, and it was around that time as well, I think the collective Japanese uh, consciousness changed. There was a uh, the first uh, publicized death of a very famous Japanese comedian, a famous television personality, um, which I think shook people in Japan to, to really become aware that, you know, how devastating uh, this illness is. A word on entry restrictions. Uh, it was on the 3rd of April that the Japanese government announced that effectively they're closing the, the Japanese borders to foreigners. Um, you know, more specifically, there are 70 countries and if you come uh, from those 70 countries, you've been in those 70 countries staying there within the last 14 days. And this list includes the, uh, the UK, uh, Korea and Taiwan, you will be refused entry uh, into Japan. Then on the 7th of April, Japan announced a state of emergency. Um, this covered at that time just seven prefectures, including the main metropolitan areas of Tokyo and Osaka. Um, and then they extended that nationwide on the 16th of April. And this is scheduled to go through to the end of the so-called Golden Week holiday period in Japan, which finishes on the 6th of May. So what does state of emergency actually mean? Well, uh, in Japan, it's very unlike the kind of lockdown that we see in, in Europe. I mentioned France earlier, places like the, the UK and also the US. Um, really, the government has been asking people voluntarily or appealing to them voluntarily to stay at home, to refrain from physical contact, social distancing. Uh, we saw at that time a number of, when the state of emergency was implemented, a number of non-essential shops begin to close down, the department stores, non-food enterprises, uh, you know, famous coffee shop chains all, 
coffee shop chains all closed. However, you know, if you go out day to day, you still see uh, quite a lot of restaurants open, uh, cafes open, independent businesses uh, still open to, to trade, albeit they have changed their business models in some way. Uh, a lot of places, particularly the food and cafes, are moving towards takeout only, uh, home delivery. Um, and the, the businesses, the other types of businesses that are open, they're implementing met, uh, uh, methods for physical distancing, so limiting the number of people in the stores, encouraging people to queue, things like that. Um, most recently, though, the governor of Tokyo, Governor Koike, um, appealed for a 12-day stay at home. So this, again, coincides with the Golden Week holidays when many people traditionally are away from their work and businesses closed down. So uh, she has asked uh, people to stay at home from last Saturday, the 25th of April through to the, the end of May. Um, sorry, not the end of May, through to the 6th of May. Um, and this really coincides at a time when there's increasing reporting about the stresses and strains at the, the health system in hospitals. So, I think anyone who's serious at mitigating the risk of a, an increase in the number of infections here in Japan will be, you know, will be mindful and be trying to take seriously this request to stay at home and to avoid physical contact, which the government is now strongly appealing for. So in summary, in Japan, we now have, we have school closures, which have been going on for a number of times, also workplace closures, a cancellation of public events and encouragement to avoid international travel, closure of borders to foreigners. Um, at the end of uh, last, as of the end of last week, um, the numbers of confirmed cases of infections uh, and also the, the deaths from COVID continue to increase here in Japan. So uh, as of today, uh, we had 13,182 confirmed cases, albeit the actual number of infections is probably significantly larger than that in Japan, uh, and a number of deaths of 348. Um, just want to say a few words on government support here in Japan and stimulus. The government is currently working on a 117 trillion yen uh, stimulus package. That's approximately one trillion US dollars. And this is going to uh, include a payment, a one-time payment, of 100,000 yen, so about $1,000 or 750 pounds to every man, woman, and child in Japan. Tokyo government has also separately announced an 800 billion yen package, uh, really for to support many of the service businesses, uh, SME type businesses, and encourage them to acquiesce to their, you know, their request that they do uh, shut up shop and uh, close down their business for this uh, you know, period of the COVID virus. In the meantime, there are a range of measures available to SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, which actually incredibly important to the Japanese economy. 99% uh, of all companies uh, in Japan, so corporate legal entities, are actually SMEs. Uh, and SMEs employ approximately 70% of the entire Japanese workforce. So the kind of things that are being offered are interest-free loans, um, support uh, to pay wages when management has asked people of those SMEs to stay at home. However, you know, these amounts are capped at fairly low uh, amounts. So uh, again, it's going to be a very challenging situation for employees of those companies um, if they are forced to stay at home or do lose their, do lose their jobs around this. Separately, um, in terms of taxation, there's a proposal out there for a one-year uh, deferral of payments of taxes, and the government has also proposed uh, a one-year carryback of loss scheme. If we could move on to the next slide now, uh, please, Sean, I'd just like to say a few things about business sentiment on the ground here. We asked our members um, earlier this month uh, about how COVID is impacting them and their business. So first of all, what kind of business continuity measures uh, have they been taking? And this is number two that you can see on the slide. And really, you know, as you'd expect, it's things like uh, replacing face-to-face -face meetings with uh, colleagues and also clients 
with virtual format. So taking meetings online, reducing social contact or physical, physical contact in that way. Also the introduction of teleworking. Um, I think it's worth noting though that there are many businesses in Japan which are, um, are actually not well set up for, for teleworking. So although you, you hear a lot about it, about it, and certainly a lot of our members are using it, I think in the broader economy, there's still a challenge where many businesses simply aren't able to um, have their people working from home. And so those people are still traveling in uh, to their places of work, commuting in, which inevitably leads to uh, physical contact. Um, the other question we asked was in what ways has COVID-19 been affecting the, uh, the corporate organization? Here we saw a decrease in demand and a diminish in business performance, uh, difficulty in forecasting, which is quite a key thing, and uh, operational challenges of remote working. So although many companies have gone to um, you know, work from home mobility, actually doing it effectively is more uh, than just giving people you know, a laptop and an iPhone. Uh, to do this effectively, I think you need to have full digital integration of systems across your business, uh, you know, paperless protocols, uh, cyber security levels have to be increased. So uh, I think a number of businesses, even though they're able to work from home, are still facing challenges around actually effectively and efficiently doing it. Um, we also asked our members to what extent um, COVID, uh, they, will, they think COVID will affect their net profits and revenues uh, in the current year 2020. Um, you know, uh, I think it stands out that 40% simply do not know, and that comes back to the point I mentioned before in terms of what ways COVID is affecting businesses. It's very difficult to forecast anything with, uh, you know, degree of certainty in this environment. So that's a challenge. For those that did uh, express a view though, uh, you know, more than one third believe that revenues and profits are gonna decrease by more than 25% in this current year. So obviously that is a significant number. Then lastly, we asked how um, we thought our members saw their businesses in two years out. Um, again, 33% simply didn't have a view, we don't know. I think this comes back once again to difficulties of forecasting anything in this current environment. Uh, positively though, one third uh, thought that the scale of their business in two years time would be around about the same uh, level as it is now, which I think demonstrates a certain degree of uh, resilience or expectation of resilience um, you know, in terms of businesses and their ability to, to withstand the challenges ahead. So, uh, to sum up really, going forward um, here in Japan, uh, everyone is really waiting to see what happens at the end of Golden Week uh, on the 6th of May when Prime Minister Abe is scheduled to uh, you know, make further announcements on what is happening uh, in Japan. So it, it's possible that could uh, you know, lead to some direction about how the government sees uh, an unwinding of the current restriction, but I think current thinking is that it's more likely that the state of emergency will be extended further beyond the end of golden week so we're, we're basically in for a, a couple of, um, of critical weeks here in japan to see whether the appeals for social distancing uh, and the reduction in physical contact uh, sting you know japanese people into complying and staying at home thereby reducing the risk of uh, infection and transmission and also to see whether the increase in uh, deaths stabilizes, enabling the health system here to continue to, to manage and, and cope effectively. Or, um, you know, sadly, if we do see an increase uh, in the number of uh, cases and deaths, whether that's going to see us, uh, you know, here in Japan, seeing experiencing some of the difficulties that other countries, um, you know, have had and would lead to a, a continued extension in the state of emergency and a deferral of expectations about when the economy can come back and recover. So that's a bit negative, but perhaps on a one final word of optimism. Um, um, I think business, you can see from our survey that business is confident that you know, together we can get through this, although there'll be some difficult, difficult times ahead. Uh, and at least in terms, of, in terms of those that did express an opinion on where those businesses would be in two years time, 
more than 75%, if you aggregate, are, you know, believe that their business will be of the same scale or larger in two years' time. So in the short term, and, you know, some tough times ahead, hopefully, though, uh, uh, you know, confidence in resilience uh, and a comeback, you know, within the next couple of years. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, before I ask any questions or, or, or um, you know, provide any thoughts from the group, let's uh, go first to Steve and then have an update also from Taiwan. Over to you, Steve. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sean. I uh, just want to say thank you for the invite. I think we're, uh, it's a, one of the weird sort of side effects of the whole COVID-19 thing at this time is it's actually encouraged a lot of regional cooperation like this. People can get online. And so, you know, you don't want to say it's a, I mean, it's a benefit, but it's a kind of a side product. Something, and a lot of companies we found are doing the same thing, that what they're actually getting into is things that they should have done for a number of years. This has forced them to kind of get into that and get them going. So a roundabout way of saying thanks for inviting us here, but it's also these, we see these opportunities for people to cooperate regionally, which is great. I'm, uh, we're in a strange position in Taiwan and we are in a very, very, very positive frame. Thank you for putting up the first one. Um, if I just run down this quickly, sometimes people don't really know about the numbers in the Taiwan economy, but we're 21st large, largest economy in the world. Um, according to the IMF, we have a purchasing power by parity of about number 19. Um, if you don't know what we do here, we're 62, more than 62% based on services. A lot of industry and manufacturing still at 36% and a very strong agricultural area, but 1.8% of the economy, but very, very strong. The one that's interesting to have a look at is kind of 2.7% GDP growth in 2019. Um, our best kind of uh, guesses from members and other people are putting this for 2020, 2020 at about 0 0.5 to 1.5, very optimistic. So the biggest influence I think of the uh, COVID-19 is gonna be on the Taiwan's GDP, although we're in a fairly safe position. And I'll get into some of the numbers on Taiwan in a moment. Um, but unemployment still remains low. People are fairly confident here. Um, but the biggest influence will be on GDP and we are an export economy. So that's obviously gonna affect a lot of what we do. And maybe if I could just move on to the next slide. Taiwan has about, at the moment, the last number I saw was 428 confirmed cases only. We've had six deaths. Um, it's probably just about the safest place you can be um, in the world right now. Um, why is this? And I think, I mean, a lot of people, sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's just, you know, the nature of people kind of, you know, Japan had the cruise ship, there's been a lot of influence of external factors. But I think uh, if you see behind this slide here, there's a picture of uh, Chen Jianren. One of the reasons that we've been very lucky here is that uh, he is the vice president. He's also an epidemiologist. Um, and he was very, very involved uh, in 2003 with the SARS epidemic. Taiwan was hit very badly in 2003. And what this did was it forced Taiwan to think about what would happen if something like this ever occurred again. Um, so, and I've got some notes in here because I want to go through these fairly carefully. It's, it's allowed Taiwan to kind of be prepared ahead of time. From that moment in 2003, we constantly thought about what if this happened again? Um, and so, you know, December last year, basically, we started um, health screening because there were rumors of the thing that going down. We shut down flights from certain locations. Um, we had our first confirmed case in January. Um, we started this mask rationing very, very early on, which is something that I think some of the population weren't too happy about it. But what it's done is it's uh, allowed the masks to be used in the locations and in the centers where they needed to be used. And it's made people aware of kind of just how valuable they are. It's also allowed Taiwan to develop this kind of uh, international medical diplomacy by using some of our now oversupply of masks to be able to donate to various different regions around the world. So it's, in some ways, it's been a positive political move on Taiwan to kind of keep the masks um, available. Uh, we had, as, as David was talking about, we school closures um, and obviously travel bans initially brought in for certain places where they were high risk, um, but ultimately shutting down all inward flights and all non-resident um, people from coming to the country. So that's been fairly, um, it's been fairly, uh, how to say, it's been fairly effective. Um, 
And in, if you look at the 428 confirmed cases, something like 86% of those are from people coming from somewhere else. Now, they may be Taiwan residents, but they may have lived overseas or been stationed overseas or whatever, returning to the country and bringing it from other places. So Taiwan has been very effective at locking down um, the source of the virus and keeping it to a minimum. We, we hope it continues. We really do. Some of the measures, and maybe I can share for other people who are listening, um, some of the measures that the government has brought in very, very early on, very quickly, was about sharing best practices. Straight away, contacting all of the kind of sister, uh, sister cities, sister relationships all around the world and just sharing immediately. Here's what we've done. Here's what we're doing. Here are the resources we have. Um, and through that exchange, have also developed, uh, you know, uh, had some really good inward information as well. Um, even before um, certain countries started their daily briefings, we've had from, I think, early January this year, we've had daily CDC briefings about what's happening, what's going on, um, you know, what number of cases we've had, et cetera. And so the population has been fairly well informed from a very early point. Um, the other point about the, what Taiwan has done is about deployment of medical staff. So very early on, again, We've used government officials, we've used the military to take over certain roles in hospitals. Um, so the administrative function of uh, certain hospitals has been run by non-medical staff. And the medical staff have then been free to look after patients and to create policies. Um, the other thing that was done very early on too was to get all of these kind of SOPs for this process um, in English. So not only were they in Chinese, but also in English so that the international community you know, our members were able to understand immediately what was going on and what was required of them. Um, implemented a lot of economic measures, um, again, quite early. Um, we brought in, the government brought in here things like rent reduction, interest rate cuts, subsidies for business, tax cuts, um, price reduction for certain essential items, um, price control on medical items like masks, PPE, this sort of stuff. So they weren't being sold to the highest bidder. Um, you know, some of the mask manufacturers were actually a little bit upset. They felt like they could have made a lot of money at this time, but the pricing was controlled so that the, everyone who needed the equipment was able to get the equipment. Um, hotels and tourism has obviously been hit a lot because of the closing down of the country, um, but they have been in some small part subsidized by creating these kind of quarantine hotels. Obviously, they're not making as much as they would have with tourists, but um, the government has been subsidizing them and helping the hotels get through that, but also creating a, an environment where people who need quarantine can be and kept safe. Um, and also, we've been quite, uh, Taiwan uh, has been very strong in the medical and biotech industries. Um, as well as this, this area of telemedicine, you know, um, off online kind of uh, diagnosis. And these are industries that are actually finding uh, some benefits. And I hate using the word benefit, but they're getting, there are opportunities for them to develop and to implement stuff that they've been uh, working on for years. The, um, David mentioned about teleworking and stuff like that. And that's obviously something that the government here has been, uh, uh, has been promoting very, very heavily. What we found was something similar here. A lot of SMEs who were maybe not necessarily ready for teleworking have had to take this whole process uh, in a very, very short space of time. They've had to go from kind of having nothing in place, a thought, and then suddenly kind of what might have taken them six months has now, you know, they've done it in kind of a week where they've converted the entire office to being online, you know, Google or Microsoft Teams, all these different kind of options. Um, and this has been one of the things we found is this, the virus has accelerated a lot of timelines, especially for companies that, that didn't have these kind of uh, emergency measures in place. So what are the good things, the things that we've learned from Taiwan? Um, as I said, we have this experience of handling SARS, which I think has been uh, very, very beneficial for Taiwan. We were hit hard, but we've learned a lot from that. The public in Taiwan is extremely open to wearing masks. In fact, people will tell you off if you're not wearing a mask, you know, so it's one of those things that I think the populace got used to it in 2013, uh, 2003 rather. And so now it's just been something that they're, they're very, very used to doing. Um, national health system. I mean, I have to say that Taiwan has one of the best national health systems that I've seen. Um, you know, the average hospital visit would be something like US $5. So people are also used to going to hospitals. They're used to having medical treatment. Um, and the hospitals themselves have responded by developing um, administrative processes where they are processing things that are not COVID 
19 related outside the hospital. So people who have to pick up uh, regular medicines, for instance, are able to pick those up from outside, from administrative personnel. So changing the way they're doing things to make people feel safe, but also kind of implementing new systems. I mean, we have more than, I think, 20,000 hospitals and clinics all around Taiwan. And one of the things that we've also been encouraging too is kind of a triage process of going to local clinics first to assess before going to major hospitals, which is this has alleviated some of the kind of um, uh, the threat of overcrowding that may well have been possible. Um, home quarantine management has been uh, strictly enforced. Very important. So we have location tracking systems and all these sort of things. Very, very technologically savvy in Taiwan. Um, not saying that nowhere else is, but you know we've implemented these things fairly quickly. Um, and things like the, map, uh, the MRT, like uh, subway, uh, the subway stations have implemented kind of stage one, stage two, stage three measures and informed the public very, very clearly through signs about, you know, what would be in place at each of these different times. Um, so I think from a, from a management point of view, I think there's some really good lessons that can be learned from the Taiwan experience. Um, and I think I'll move through to my next slide, if I may. Um, I just want to talk a very short, very quick little bit about, you know, what we as an organization have had to do. Um, reflecting what, I said, the Taiwan government has been doing and what business has been doing, we basically have had to move everything online. We've had, we've worked from home, um, we wear masks, we've had to change all of the events, no big events, no physical events. As an organization, uh, a British Chamber of Commerce, where we're used to kind of, I guess, revenues and uh, a lot of stuff coming from our events, we've had to change what we do. And this is, I think... Uh, Long term, in some ways, this is going to be good for us because we come up with new ways of doing things as we're doing today. Some of you may recognize some of your own members here. Um, we have, uh, I think we have Japan, we have uh, Singapore and some others in the room here as well. Um, and in terms of trade for us, it's the trade work that we do. It's kind of business as usual. People are still interested in Taiwan. Obviously, they can't travel, um, but they're still interested. And so we're continuing uh, the work we do in that area. Maybe I'll move on now if I could. Move to my next uh, slide. I wanted to share some of the, we didn't do a specific business survey ourselves because there were a couple of very good ones that were already being done. Um, so we were, we had some information that was shared with us from our member company, ADECO. Um, we also had the Edelman Trust Survey, which was released recently. And we have another member, Independent Marketing, Marketing and Research Limited, um, who shared some of the business sentiment regarding COVID-19 with us. Um, one of the interesting ones, if we go from a kind of a macro to a micro perspective, the independent marketing research does an annual survey of business satisfaction. What they noted was that the five year outlook, which was at about 52% positive, um, has dropped a little bit down to somewhere around 46%. So there's been a slight reduce in kind of people's long term perspective, um, but it's still a reasonably optimistic um, approach to business here. Um, the biggest kind of areas that people viewed as affecting their business. Now, um, this report hasn't been released yet. This is, uh, as I said, shared with us from uh, ADECO. We can't release the numbers, so I can't put them up on screen for you, but I'll share a couple of kind of the big factors that came out. Um, most people obviously um, see that revenue is uh, the biggest issue. Revenue is down. Some say 5%, some say 7%. Other companies we've spoken to, 30 to 50%, depending on the nature of their business. It's had to involve a whole strategic change. Things have to be done, have to be done differently. A lot of projects have to be postponed. I mean, we saw just simply doing events and things like that. There's a big influence on that, but a lot of companies have had to put things off until the following year. HR has been, uh, has been influenced quite a lot. Recruitment, obviously. So companies are not taking on new staff, uh, rather they're not replacing staff. Um, somewhere around 60% of companies have said that they will simply maintain the staff that they've got now and they're not going to be recruiting more people um, in the future. And a lot of companies are obviously doing things like uh, unpaid leave, um, trying to use up unpaid leave, forcing people to go on holidays now. Um, with very few companies, around 7% were saying that they would uh, actually have to lay people off. And I think these are more the ones that have had some serious economic impact. Um, the one thing, and I think this maybe is, uh, was mirrored with what David was talking about, is that most companies would like to see more from the government. I mean, although I think we've had a fairly positive response from the Taiwan government here, I think that the, you know, a lot of companies would like to see more subsidies, more tax breaks, 
um, things like this. And the, the last thing I want to share about the kind of the, uh, the company was this kind of remote systems. David talked about this as well, um, implementing remote systems. Most of the large corporates had the ability to kind of get into this very, very quickly. Um, but we found a lot of the uh, SMEs who responded were uh, less strong in this area. And they were finding it difficult to kind of, you know, click straight over to doing things where they'd been used to kind of meeting up with people, traveling when they needed to, et cetera, to, to be doing all these things online was making it slightly difficult for them. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one. My next slide, if I may. I just wanted to talk a little bit. We're based inside the embassy here, and I wanted to um, talk a little bit about what the UK government in Taiwan has been doing because they've been very supportive. Um, and there's some lessons here as well. First thing, basically supporting UK citizens. And as I'm aware, all of the UK citizens who wanted to get out of Taiwan or needed to get out of Taiwan were able to do so. Um, a lot of news sharing. So the information about COVID-19, what they were doing, how things were developing, all of this. And we did the same thing. We developed new pages on our website. We developed new newsletters so that we can inform and keep in touch with our members in the same way as the UK government was also keeping in touch with uh, UK business and with UK citizens in Taiwan and setting up a, a dedicated support team. With Taiwan in the position that it's in now, one of the things that the UK government representatives in Taiwan has been able to do is actually work with Taiwan on procurement. So we have a lot of manufacturing here. We have some surplus in some essential items. And so the UK government has been working with Taiwan manufacturers to try and get supplies to help the UK. So, I mean, we've, we've sourced something like 60 ventilators. Um, we've supported logistics for a donation of 1 million masks that went out to the UK. And at the moment, uh, the Department of International Trade is focusing on the PPE, uh, the personal protective equipment, in particular gowns and stuff like that, um, to source those so that we can help um, with the UK. And if I just go to my last slide now. So, I think uh, the sentiment in Taiwan is actually fairly popular, is fairly positive. Um, you know, we've had low number of cases. We've had a very low number of deaths. We've had some influence from, you know, on the business. Um, but in general, if I kind of my last message, if you like, is that people are seeing the first half of this year obviously is gone. Second half of this year will, will be down. Um, probably 2020 will be, you know, somewhere between, as I said at the beginning, uh, 0.5 to 1.5 GDP only against an original forecast of 2.7. Um, but looking fairly positive for most of the businesses and members that we talk to in terms of 2021. And with that, I'd like to pass it back to Sean. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. So um, interesting to see that parallel against uh, Japan and also I think um, it also has uh, um, some similarities with what's happening here in Korea, but also some differences. So I'll, I'll now talk a little bit about the case in Korea. I'm aware of time now. It's uh, 12.40, we have 20 minutes. So I'll try to keep mine as short as possible to allow for some questions. So. For those of you that are attending, if you do have some questions, please stick them into the into the chat box there, the, the Q&A chat box, and I'll be sure to, to address them to the speakers. Um, yeah, so just in terms of Korea then, let me jump to it. So go to the first slide. Okay, so first of all, I'm, I'm gonna talk about three different areas when it comes to our particular market. The first, just an overview of COVID itself, and then a little bit on the government response. And then finally, on, on private sector response, which is primarily covered by our own membership uh, survey. So I, um, I will skip some sections that I was going to talk about, because I think, for example, the response has uh, been fairly similar across the region, but also across the world in terms of how the companies are dealing with the situation. So I won't dwell on those, but I'll talk about the things that that are a little bit different or unique to our market. But first of all, in terms of the um, outbreak itself, as you can see on the chart here, now it's a little bit difficult to see the exact date, so let's not worry too much about that. It's more to just show you the, the trend of where we're at. So obviously the first case has happened in mid-February, and then and now you can see that where, you know, it peaked you know, at around the, 
uh, if you can see here, at, at around early March. And then actually, um, now we're at 10 cases. So as of yesterday, uh, we're, we're down to 10 cases. And often, day to day, those a good portion of those 10, they're usually four or five, are actually coming from overseas, which are returning Korean nationals, mostly coming back from the United States. And that's being very well contained. So you can see that actually, for almost the last three weeks, we've had a very low level. So um, in terms of public health situation, it's very positive. Now, if you then think about, well, what, how did this happen in the chronology of this? So actually, Korea began with a level one uh, alert level in January when there was the first confirmed case in January 19, actually. Um, a bit like um, Taiwan, you know, the uh, experiences that Korea had with SARS and also with MERS mean, meant that, you know, there was a very quick uh, and effective response to that in terms of development of test kits and also um, the health system's uh, ability to move to to test people. So even though things were still at a level one, actually the in the background equipment was being purchased and, and things were being mobilized by the uh, the government in order to, to be in, in place for when things were uh, going to get worse and it was expected that that would be the case. Um, so if you look then fast forwards to closer to mid-February, that's when you had a, the sort of big uh, cluster of, um, of cases and that came and it was well documented wow. in the media that came through uh, a cult actually that was uh, effectively had gathered a number of people also internationally had flown in for the funeral of, of I think it was the brother of the leader. And, and so actually, contrary to the um, government advice not to gather, that they gathered. And, and actually, that cluster broke out in a city called Daegu, which is one of, you know, one of Korea's uh, southern cities. And through that cluster, I think that's where really the country went from level three up to, up to level four. And then you have um, high government intervention. Prior to that, actually, it was, you know, it was uh, mid-February where the government was as a advice was uh, telling companies to work from home and people were doing that. Um, but actually it wasn't until after that cluster that I think things really started to, um, to get serious because of the, the number really jumped very rapidly. And so actually Korea started to, um, to implement very strong social distancing rules at that point. But it's worth pointing out that Korea's never entered a, a state of emergency and also it never had any form of uh, lockdown. So what I would say is that even though it hasn't, uh, effectively it's had strong social distancing from mid-February. And I think such is the civic nature of, of, um, of, of the Korean people that actually once, although that was simply advisory and it took until March 22nd for the government to really come out very strongly and, and create those social distances uh, regulations, actually it's been uh, effectively in pace from, from the point at which it was advice. So if you compare that to maybe the UK, where I think initial advice to stay at home by a certain portion of the population was ignored as people went on to do um, whatever activities they were doing. And it took uh, a further um, pleas, I think, by the government to act in a civic responsible way. I think that in Korea, actually, and I suspect the same was in, in Japan and Taiwan, uh, people simply acted on that advice uh, very effectively. And so Korea has been now we're in almost week nine of pretty strong social distancing without having, you know, full, um, you know, lockdown. So if we go to the next slide. So then, okay, what was it that Korea did? I think this has also been, you know, fairly well documented, but it, it, it began its 3T strategy. And it seems like um, Taiwan did a similar thing. And if anything, Taiwan actually was a, a lot more forceful in how it it reacted to to it, and, and that seems to have been very effective. Korea, I think, was um, a little bit more gradual, but very detail oriented and, and very um, and very effective in what it did. So it began extreme, extremely high levels of testing. So Korea actually to date has tested over six hundred thousand people, and you know, obviously, if you compare that to some of the markets in uh, some countries in the UK, uh, in in Europe, that's a, a a high proportion of the population and it, it did it very quickly as well as that it began a very intense level of tracing and of course uh, the use of technology was important in that but also 
you know, people's willingness to to part with with data and report where they were and who they met. And and so anecdotally, to give you an example, you know, one of our staff had been to a clinic the day after a patient had been found to be positive in that clinic, was contacted by the form of the text message, and then a phone call asked to attend the following day a test, um, to take a test, and then the following day after that, the person was uh, told that the test result was negative, and and all through that, that was all done within within three days, and so, and that was being in a location the day after a patient was found, and so that gives you an idea the extent to which you know um, all the data was integrated, and also people were on top of this in order to stop uh, the spread. So I think it, it's been in a very sort of effective strategy that that's gone on. So if we go to the next slide. Um, you'll see here now, again, it's uh, maybe a bit small for everyone to see, but you can just see the level of, uh, of, of testing relative to the size of the population and Korea has been very strong with that. Okay. Next slide. Um, some of the uh, measures that have been brought in, I think were, Korea was one of the first to do it, were you know, things like um, these testing units. And so it's a, it's a bit like a phone booth, and, but it completely... Um, a very effective way to stop the spread even for those medical professionals. And of course, Korea now is very much an, uh, an exporter of PPE as well as test equipment uh, to Europe and the US. And so Korea was actually very, very well equipped in terms of uh, PPE and also in terms of the processes needed to test effectively without any spread. Uh, as Steve mentioned, actually, masks were also rationed here and still are actually now i think the rationing is uh is rationing may have stopped you can you although you, you can more freely buy them but um you know now uh, the the rationing is effectively stopped but uh it was the case that you could only purchase two masks per week for each individual within your family and that it had to be that individual that went to the pharmacy to get it uh, unless that individual, um, you know, one of the family members was a child, and, and in which case, you know, you're allowed to purchase on behalf of the child. And so they, that was uh, instituted in order to, to allow for uh, PP, but particularly mass, to, to be going to the right people and uh, very much uh, accepted by the population as well as a measure that was needed. So if we just go to the next slide. So on the, on the impact, of course, you know, we talk to our members and the members, um, you know, have been severely, most of them have been significantly impacted over, uh, of course, in terms of revenue, but in terms of organizationally and logistically as to how they're running their business. And whilst Korea hasn't had the full lockdown, there has been a number of um, financial rescue packages that have been brought out, particularly for SMEs. And a, a lot of the UK multinationals are, are small and medium sized enterprises here in this market. So, you know, there has been a, you know, a fund brought out which allows for lending for those companies. There's also been a, a program to provide low interest rate loans, you know, for those companies, as well as credit guarantees up to 90%. And then employment, employment retention subsidies, which are 90% of the suspension or, or um, retain, uh, of salaries up to a certain cap as well as deferrals on, on, on things like loans as well. So I think the government has been putting out different measures um, in terms of financial packages, which have helped, but I think there are more yet to come, but maybe not haven't yet been to the extent needed uh, in Europe. Um, in terms of workplace guidance, guidance, you know, the government is also very quick to come out and to, uh, you know, um, ask people to adopt flexible working hours, working from home, as well as, um, you know, to, can, uh, I guess, uh, advise corporations to be more hygienic in the way that they provide, uh, you know, uh, hand sanitizer and disinfectant, but no different to anywhere else. The only difference, I think, may have been the speed of which they did it. So how has that affected our members? As you can see, you know, uh, in general spending, of course, consumer spending is down, mobility is down, and so, a lot of our members, whether it's B2C or B2B, have been significantly affected uh, by this, and some, of course, moderately. If you go to the next slide, uh, what does this mean in terms of revenue? So reduced revenue. At the time that we, we did this survey, actually, we chose 10% uh, as a ceiling here, but I think that could now be, obviously, a lot higher. Um, and we will run the survey again to understand to 
what extent this has changed, but certainly of the 50% felt that revenues would be uh, affected by 10% or more. And, and I think anecdotally now we're, we're hearing anything from 20%, 30%, even 40% uh, from, from our members as well. So next slide. Um, the the areas that's affected, I don't think it's any different to anyone else, so I'll, I'll uh, leave this uh, for now. Okay. And in terms of recovery, so, you know, we actually had a presentation given to us by the head of uh, economic policy uh, at Standard Chartered Bank last week. And in the recovery, it was felt it really depends on, of course, whether there, there may be or may not be a second wave and also how lots of other markets do. But uh, in terms of Korea, the vast majority felt that it would take around six months for that to recover. I think, you know, this is, again, in a market which is so dependent on, on, on export, this is really to do with uh, the rest of the world as well. So I think this really speaks more to this domestic market. Now, of course, if your business is very tied to international travel, then it's going to take longer than that one would suspect. But in general, it was felt that six months it will be how long it will take to for this domestic market to return to some sort of sense of uh, normality um, and I think this is uh, in flux and changing all the time but yeah six months is, is what our members are thinking when we spoke to, when we did have that presentation by the standard chartered economist he felt that global economy will shrink by 0.6 percent this year and and actually recession will hit that's worse than certainly the financial crisis and and worse than than others in the past as, as well so and Korea, whilst it, I think, will be a, somewhat sh sheltered from that in the, in the short term, because the situation here is a, a little bit better, um, its connection and its export business is going to be hugely affected by that, particularly with uh, Europe and the US. And so whilst those numbers are not out yet, um, it's expected that uh, those uh, export volumes will have shrunk a lot. And also, despite some recovery in China, that recovery hasn't been a V-shaped recovery. And so actually, um, you know, things are, are looking very pessimistic, at least for this year, but possibly going into the next. Okay, so next slide. Um, so yeah, so what are some of the, the measures being t taken on by our members? I think the obvious ones are there are a lot of cost cutting, adjustments of budgets, which is difficult to do, certainly hiring freezes, and also uh, seeking of financial support. So the those are the, the key measures. And so... As Steve mentioned, and also David before him, we expect that this year will be a year of having to adapt, but also having to effectively uh, take some losses in order to hopefully bounce back next year. But depending on the business, um, no one quite knows uh, how long that will take. Okay, and the next one. So yeah, so what are they instituting? I think this one, I we can we can uh, leave this for. Uh, uh, for now, I think, because a lot of these uh, are being instituted everywhere else in, in the region and also globally. So I think that, um, you know, I can leave uh, this slide, but, you know, very practical things being put in place and, and by our members. I think the biggest one, um, you know, is the, the fact that things that are completely necessary are now being moved online and, and just uh, in terms of our own business, you know, we are there's two things that are happening in the short term. Of course, we're using this medium in order to be able to engage our members uh, in, in some way. Um, the other thing is that actually, even though things are being, uh, social distancing is likely to be liberalized to some extent uh, on May 5th. Uh, May 6th is when we are expecting things to be made a little bit uh, easier uh, and also mobility to be a little bit liberalized by the Korean government because you know the cases are so low, so low. It doesn't mean that we are going back to our regular calendar of events. So for example, we usually have a big celebration for the Queen's birthday. I, we just don't see any, a situation whereby four, 500 people gathering, sipping champagne and, and enjoying some networking or dancing and mingling in that way is really gonna be A, practical and B, uh, really the kind of sentiment or the kind of event that really um, speaks to the mood of, of, of the country, but also of, of the UK in particular. And so we'll be adapting to our um, situation and, and changing the nature of the events themselves, including reducing particular events. And so there is a, it, it is a forcing our hand to, to adapt there as well. So 
Okay, so I think that will be it from Korea. So let me just um, go to some questions. Okay. This one is for you, David, and it says that um, in Japan they've announced that they're going to buy unlimited amounts of bonds. And do you think this may cause some hyperinflation? Um, I'm not an economist, but there's always obviously some risk. I, I think more relevant though is the fact that Japan, like many other uh, central banks, has limited policy options available. Uh, interest rates are already at rock bottom. Um, and I think the bigger, you know, the bigger risk for many countries, I think, is the fear of, you know, what a, a total collapse in confidence could do. So rather than run the risk of a total collapse in, in confidence and a knock on effect in the real economy, uh, a number of central banks have made a statement that they're prepared to do almost whatever it takes to support the economy. And you know, like we saw after the, um, you know, the Lehman shock, the financial crisis back in 2008. Uh, governments are willing to, um, you know, engage in extraordinary uh, fiscal measures. So um, there is always some risks with it, but I think the, the I'm sure the concern at the moment is to uh, uh, try and protect the economy uh, and uh, main some, maintain some level of confidence. Okay, and we also have a question on. Uh, it's a more broader question, but how? How do you feel about the likelihood of the transition from health crisis to economic crisis, bearing in mind the new unemployment statistics coming out of the US? So I think actually it might be uh, interesting for either one of you also to broaden that question and just ask about, you know, maybe this is more pertinent for myself and also for, for Taiwan. But as your, you know, as the infection rate has come down and now we have um, sort of from a public health perspective, a, a well known, um, positive case of, of how to deal with the virus. Where are things in terms of uh, consumer spending and, and on that side of things, Stephen, and how are things like uh, unemployment um, and, and the sentiment generally uh, in the market? Is the government really pushing to try and um, instill some sort of confidence in the market with certain measures or where, where does Taiwan stand in terms of as we're coming out of this economic? And I'm just uh, unmuted myself. Thanks, Sean. Um, as David said, I'm not an economist either. Um, but you also mentioned, Sean, that basically uh, most people feel like we're heading into some sort of recession. Um, so I think the question, and uh, I know Mike, it's from Mike Cottingham. He's, uh, he's in Taiwan here. Um, the idea that we're moving into recession, I think we, we are moving into a recession. You've got the, you've had the kind of the crisis of uh, the health crisis and the health crisis itself is creating an economic crisis. I think it's something that we just have to face up to. It is happening. It's a reality. Um, most of the smart people that I talk to, the economists that I talk to, talk about things like cash versus credit. You know, and if you're going to kind of alleviate the, the problems, you've got to be looking at ensuring that your cash reserves are, you know, and these are fairly simple economic principles. But I think one of the reasons why Asia tends to come out of these recessions stronger than perhaps other locations is because we have high levels of savings, high levels of cash. Companies are fairly conservative when it comes to kind of throwing money around. They tend not to borrow as much as other places. Um, and you're looking at, I mean, some statistics you saw from the US where they said something like about 30% of the population couldn't get a thousand dollars together um, just to buy essentials. And I think what you have is an economy, the US, which is a very big, very strong economy. And a lot of our, our economies in Asia rely on that because we export, we, you know, we produce products for there. Um, but it's a country that's been living on credit for a very, very long time. And that's going to affect globally. There's going to be a trickle down effect to places like Taiwan, Korea, less so perhaps in Japan, which, uh, and David can maybe talk to this, um, but you know, economies like uh, Korea and Taiwan, where we are export based are definitely gonna be affected by this. The companies, and I think the populations are in a reasonably safe space because again, it's this cash versus credit. They're, they save, they keep money, 
they invest in kind of sensible things, if you like. Um, but when it comes to continuing in their businesses to sell items, to sell products, the Taiwanese market is going to suffer because there aren't going to be those available uh, export markets. Locally and domestically, I think we're going to be able to get through this because uh, we'll be able to, you know, hunker down. Um, and again, you know, there will be cash to spend here. There are government incentives. There's something like about 60 billion NT that's being put into the market to support this. So, you know, I think we're kind of going to be okay in a, in a, in a microcosm, but definitely the global economic recession will affect a lot of businesses here. Perhaps not the international businesses so much in Taiwan, but it's going to affect the local businesses very, very, very severely. So David, then I wonder for you, how, how are some of the, what are some of the predictions for where the Japanese economy will be this year? Or is it still a bit early to tell, bearing in mind that the, um, the situation, that, the stage that you're at? Yeah, I think it's still too early to put uh, concrete numbers on it, but everyone believes we're, we're heading into a, a severe recession like the, the rest of the world. Uh, Japan is also a, uh, has many companies which are uh, export an awful lot around the world. And many of the domestic companies here in Japan are actually supporting those supply chains. So uh, the difficulties in the global economy and any downturn in uh, global trade is uh, going to have a negative impact. Um, you know, and I think that's why we see the governments uh, taking extraordinary measures. Um, you know, exports may be down. Um, they're clearly trying to uh, maintain confidence amongst the domestic, you know, the population here, try and get consumers to spending. Uh, I think, you know, that's going to be a tough challenge. But you see measures like they're giving cash handouts to, you know, every individual in Japan. So they'll, they'll do what they can, I'm sure, to boost, um, uh, you know, private consumption here in Japan. I think you'll see the you know, massive government spending on projects to, uh, you know, you know, inject energy into the economy uh, and maybe uh, encouragement for Japanese companies to spend some of their massive cash piles. Uh, we are going into a, a difficult situation, but primarily this is a health crisis. So I think all governments around the world, although we're now seeing some of this in our region are clearly at different stages in the fight, um, governments need to you know, address the health problem. And, uh, you know, there are going to be economic problems in the future, but it's, uh, you know, I think they're going to have to deal with those once they've got the health situation under control. Yeah, 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 agreed. And uh, then an another question here then is, uh, it's addressed at Taiwan, but I think it probably applies to all of us. And, and I'll, I'll go first in answering it. It's, it's more to do with what we might be doing to support uh, UK companies who have interest in the market and what, what it is that we're providing for them. I think, so just on Career First, obviously we're all member-based organizations and our members are primarily in this market, but because of the um, situation that we have in the UK, I, I think certainly from our side, on the Department of International Trade contract that, that we have, and I know that, that that's in Taiwan as well, but not in Japan, but the, we are obviously helping uh, those UK companies with giving them advice as to what to do in this market. A lot of the projects that we were doing to help them enter the market have been paused uh, at, at our suggestion because it's just impractical to be able to do a lot of the work. And also, obviously, they're not going to be coming to the market anytime too, or soon. We um, Obviously, when it's you know things to do with research and understanding the market, we can still do that. So we are helping companies where possible. But in the meantime, you know we've held calls with a couple of different organizations in UK just to provide insight as to what, what was happening here. And that was done one last week, one a couple of weeks before with the British Chambers. And so we've sort of pivoted to essentially provide information and insight where we can. Um, there's a question also speaks to, well, now that UK companies can't travel, what can we do for them? Obviously, it's limited what we um, can do because we can't substitute for their own traveling to the market. Um, but obviously, we're being we're adapting by just uh, providing information rather than um, than supporting with that direct visit to the market. And and we expect we hope that things will be better in September, October for these types of initiatives. But at the moment, you know, I think the best we can do is to to be a vehicle of information. So I I don't know whether any of you are what would like to add to that as uh, the. Steve, in, in Taiwan, the question was, was primarily towards yourself. I, would you like to add anything? 
Sure. If I could just, uh, and I'm just looking for the, it's Graham Davis, I see. Okay. Hi, Graham. Um, the, so I guess there were two aspects of this. One is the kind of aspect that Sean was talking about just now, which is very, very, I called it business as usual. Um, it's probably business is not quite as usual as always, but um, it, we are still continuing to support British business. We are still continuing to provide information and uh, you know, anybody who contacts us, we'll do exactly the same things as, uh, as Sean was talking about there. One of the other sides of this where there are things that are in place that need to be done in country and it requires foreign expertise to do them. One of the things in Taiwan is the offshore wind industry, which is, uh, is booming right now. So one of the issues that uh, the Department of International Trade here is addressing is this issue of how to get people into Taiwan when currently because of the health crisis, it's, it's more or less shut down for international traffic. So there may well be opportunities to work with the Taiwan government to get people in um, for certain necessary projects that are ongoing if they're not talking about business travel and stuff like that. So there are, there are, I think there are kind of two different aspects to Graham's question there. Business as usual, but obviously we're not expecting people to come and travel, as Sean says, um, more reports. And the other side of that is that if there are kind of services or projects that need to be done in the economy itself, um, then we are working with people to find ways to get through those. It'll involve quarantine, it'll involve all sorts of uh, hoops to have to go through, but we're still trying to work on uh, assisting those projects. Okay, David, anything else to add there? Um, yeah, very similar. We'll continue to, um, you know, respond to questions and provide information to uh, British companies. Uh, one positive thing that I've seen anecdotally from the UK is um, a number of companies. Uh, there was one last week uh, in, um, you know, small powder technologies, um, actually starting to convert some of their own content into Japanese, which I thought was fantastic. So Japan is actually it's a potentially a massive market. Uh, Japanese, um, you know, counterparties or potential customers and clients are very discriminating, but it is a huge market. So I think British companies, um, it's fantastic if they can tell their story in a very accessible way. So many British companies have tremendous products and services. Um, and so I was, you know, heartened to see some of them starting to convert their webinars, having them translated their online materials into Japanese. So remotely being better able to connect with potential, um, you know, um, purchasers, clients and customers here in uh, the Japanese market. Yeah, and then I wonder also if um, for you guys, I know that Steve, for example, your, your office is uh, within the embassy grounds and, and David, I, 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 in your presentation, I, di I didn't see much about, um, you know, how things are locally in terms of government, uh, British government support, but I thought it might be interesting for us to, to just uh, sort of pose that question of how has that been in terms of with the embassy? Where's your role relative to what the embassy is doing? Are you helping a little bit in terms of consular or travel advice? I know that in Korea, we found that the, um, you know, for example, the ambassador has spoken on one of our webinars and was very good at providing an update of how things are in the UK, but also what they're doing here locally. I know that as Steve mentioned, there's been a lot of uh, focus on procurement at the moment in order to get equipment from Korea over to the UK. Uh, and so I know the embassy is working on that. We found them, you know, very open and willing to discuss, you know, how they can help British businesses. And obviously to some extent is uh, limited what, what, what anyone can do in this situation. Um, but I, I just wonder your, how things are on the ground in terms of your um, relationship and, and sort of uh, way that you're working with the, the embassy. Maybe over to you, David. Yeah, so the, in Japan, the British Chamber of Commerce in Japan is completely independent uh, of the embassy. Having said that, though, we work very closely with them. So we know that the embassy team, you know, since the COVID situation started developing here, they've been working extremely hard. Uh, initially, I believe the, uh, you know, a lot of the effort was obviously around uh, consular support to uh, British nationals. Um, but increasingly now, um, you know, we're working with them uh, on online formats uh, aimed at businesses. So the uh, British ambassador to Japan and his team spoke on a BCCJ webinar last week, 
uh, you know, providing messages and, uh, you know, from the government side, the British government perspective, but also taking questions from our members, um, you know, in terms of how the government can provide some support and also in separate formats that we've encouraged our members to join. The British Embassy has been setting up, uh, you know, video conferences, opportunities to get the, the British business community together. Uh, and again, to, to share experiences, best practices, and enable the, the government, the British government, to understand what British companies in the market here in Japan need in terms of support. So, uh, you know, it's, it's been a close working relationship, and I think, um, you know, that close communication will, you know, be the foundation for what we continue to do going forward in collaboration with the embassy here. Yeah, yeah. and yourself, Steve? Yeah, so I, I should just point out, we have a representative office here, um, so it's not an embassy. Um, but in a sense, it functions as the representative, or, you know, it represents the, the UK government, the UK authorities in Taiwan. Um, we, you know, the fact that our office is inside the representative office has been really good for us. Um, it's great for us in terms of just fielding questions and uh, all of this kind of, you know, UK citizens who have questions about what's going on, it's easy for us to kind of just pop around the corner and find the right person to get a, an immediate answer for them. So I think, uh, you know, the UK authorities in Taiwan have been extremely supportive um, and we enjoy a good working relationship with them. We've been involved in the kind of the weekly meetings, the task force, um, helping to source products for the UK at this time as well. So I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a nice relationship that has, been a benefit to both sides where we can bring British business in but we can also um, help the UK side and help our members as well to be part of the push to support the UK from Taiwan as well. Yeah agreed on that so um, I think now looking at the time it's just time to wrap up I think as um, as we've all sort of pointed out you know it's been very much about public health. It's now going into a phase, uh, at least uh, in most markets or a lot of markets where public health going into economic recovery and, and, and also adaption more longer term. And, you know, as you said, Steve, it's, it's not exactly a benefit, but maybe as a response to this crisis, I think it's uh, important that, you know, we have that support from the British government, which we do have, and also that we reach out and create those networks um, more regionally. Um, and that's been a, a very positive thing in terms of this uh, webinar and hopefully going forward. So I just want to thank you both for being part of this. I know you must be uh, very busy in your respective markets. So really thank you and thank you to your teams that have supported uh, this as well. And so without any further ado, I'd let everyone enjoy their lunch and, uh, and leave the meeting now. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.